Um, flexo tendon reconstruction is truly a, an art form. It's really flexo tendon grafting. Uh, you don't see it all that often. Uh, as Tom Davenport pointed out, uh, everybody's repairing tendons in zone two, and so the primary tendon graft that you used to see frequently is not done. The actual, I know this quote is, the actual tendon graft is now done for those patients who come in extremely late where you cannot reapproximate tendons or for failed uh, operative repair of flexor tendons, patients who have plateaued in therapy with less than the optimum functional result. Uh, so when you see a patient who does not have a good tendon function following either repair or absolutely nothing, you can opt to do nothing. The patient can often function well if one single digit is not working well. Uh, you can attempt a chemolysis, thinking that the flexor tendon is still intact, but requires some relief from the scar tissue holding it back. Uh, and then when you talk about flexor grafting, it's either a single stage or a multi-stage uh, procedure. Uh, and that depends upon how the patient presents to you in the beginning. Uh, certainly when there is scar on the tendon, flexor tendon is not gliding, or when there's been previous fractures, you anticipate that that is not the most optimum circumstance. Uh, so you're going to uh, stage your tendon reconstruction accordingly. And of course, as Dr. Davenport pointed out as well, a fully damage is essential. Uh, you have to restore that if you're going to optimize your medical, uh, your surgical results. So uh, when we talk about no man's land again before 1960, nobody uh, fixed the tendon in the sheath, uh, thinking that the junctures would block motion and you would get a finger that was non-functional, it's just not worth doing. So they relegated these patients to primary tendon grafting by going in immediately and replacing the entire tendon from distal tip of the finger into the hand usually, uh, because the lumbar bull is still holding the profundus. Uh, and that was their primary uh, reconstruction and they had a reasonably good result. In 1963, however, Hunter came out with a two-stage reconstruction for those patients who had such great destruction from fractures or extensive scarring, uh, he uh, put together a silastic rod, which was to create a housing within the <coughs> finger and then substitute that with a tendon graft secondarily. I uh, thought that would avoid the adhesions, the irregularities of previous fracture and the excessive scarring in that region. Uh, in 69, there were a lot of things that were postulated. A pedicle tendon graft was made by taking the superficialis and sewing it to the proximal portion of the profundus, putting a rod in and then secondarily coming back and sectioning the superficialis and creating a uh, large tendon, quite bulky, uh, bringing it through to the tip of the finger. That didn't really work out too well and fell by the wayside quickly. And then of course when you're thinking about tendon grafting for your reconstruction, uh, you have to think about the possibility of tendon transfers. My Christy is coming to go through the options that you have there. It's quite different. Uh, it can give you an immediate reconstruction or immediate result, but of course it depends upon at what level your tendon is transected. So the flexor tendon anatomy, uh, I'm not going to go through the details. Again, Mike Christie is going to talk to you about the anatomy and the biology of the tendon, uh, but basically you're dealing with your profundus and superficialis. Uh, it's important that your blood supply remain intact, uh, if possible, to that area. You're looking at the pulley system, which is essential for your best result, and of course, uh, is there underlying bone fracture, callus, anything that's going to disrupt the eventual glide of your tendon. So you have to take all that into consideration when you're going to reconstruct. Obviously, you're looking to reconstruct the, profen the profundus tendon and the superficialis. It's often sacrificed uh, in those circumstances. And your pulley system is uh, essentially a very concentrated, dense, connective tissue that's strategically located in the finger itself. Its purpose is to restrain the tendons from bowstringing and, in effect, creating your maximum mechanical efficiency so that tendon can, uh, can grasp the fingers to the uh, distal palmar area with strength. You can see the, uh, do I have a pointer here? You can see uh, in the lower right-hand corner the intimate relationship between the synovial sheath and the bone. And so when that bone is fractured, you can anticipate significant scarring that's going to take place within that synovial sheath and it's going to really restrict some of your outcomes that you have there. So let's take the options that are available to you for tendon grafting. Uh, one is a single-stage reconstruction. Uh, 
the important things is that your neurovascular pedicle is intact. You want that patient to be able to feel the tip of the finger so when they begin the therapy, they know exactly where the finger is and how to get the maximum improvement from that. You would like a finger with minimum scarring. And so take, for example, a patient who has a tendon laceration in the mid-palmer area, proximal to the sheath. The tendon that remains is your spacer in the sheath. Uh, there's minimal scarring. If you do it early enough, the joint should still be supple. You have an intact pulley system, smooth tendon bed, and in this case, I would choose palmaris for a very short tendon graft from tip into the profundus tendon that's still in the palm. I'll do that for primary grafting only because I don't think there's a lot of scarring at that short interval in the palmar region. Uh, when you're considering long-term problems in here, I think fibrosis sets into the palm very quickly and you don't get the excursion of that profundus tendon uh, giving you what you're looking for at the end. And again, your motor uh, for an early short-term primary graft, as I said, would be the uh, same profundus tendon which is in the palm area. But we're most familiar with the two-stage reconstruction, taking patients who have had uh, single-stage repair uh, with a less than favorable outcome. So the important things to look at before you propose tendon grafting is how much scarring are we dealing with? Is that finger stiff? Uh, has there been an altered subcutaneous tissue from extensive damage? Uh, the pulley system, is it intact? And if not, you're going to have to rebuild it. Uh, and most of all, you need a cooperative patient because this is a six to eight month commitment from the time you start to the time you finish your multiple procedures and the patient goes through extensive, <coughs> in ther extensive hand therapy. For these patients where I'm putting a two-stage graft in, I'm going to leave, uh, put the silastic rod in from the fingertip and into the distal forearm and my motor is going to be uh, the adjacent FDP tendon that's in the forearm area uh, and again I'm going to rebuild my pulleys at the same time as the rod is going in so you have a pretty good open incision as you can see there you're assuring that all of your pulleys are adequate again if you've done a repair initially within zone 2 scarring is going to affect that the sheath is going to collapse and you're going to have to rebuild that in order to accommodate the uh, silastic sheet and eventually the uh, tendon graft. And with the rod in the uh, forearm, I'm going to choose the plantaris. It gives me a longer length to work with, and we'll talk about the reason for the need for that longer uh, tendon graft. It also takes the juncture outside of the scar area, which I think is an essential principle for tendon grafting. So the pearls that I've uh, learned through usually not paying attention to the pearls is that first you have to release your joints and relieve the scar tissue. You've got to manipulate that hand, passive range of motion and splinting in the hands of a very good therapist who understands where the goal is. And here is a test of the patient's compliance because if they cannot work well with the therapist early on, uh, and I'm not saying if they've reached their maximum improvement or if they're in terrible pain, but I think you need to know whether they will remain compliant with the protocol that you're going to give them long term. The rod goes in, the pulleys are rebuilt. I leave the proximal portion of the rod free in the forearm and I'll attach the distal portion to the tip of the finger, actually. And I'll go through the junctures and the insertion in just a moment. Uh, eventually, you're setting your tension in a very careful way. And the interesting thing is that tendon grafts will grow with children. In fact, they're probably the best outcomes that we've had. So you don't have to be uh, worried that it'll tether the finger as time goes on. Uh, and so the sequence that I will do for these patients in a two-stage reconstruction is again begin with passive range of motion, trapping the finger, stretching the finger, uh, trying to get the scar tissue as supple as possible. I'm going to remove the digitorum uh, profundus and superficialis or whatever remains in the sheath. Sometimes it's heavily scarred and you're taking that out um, at, the, at the initial time, at the insertion of the rod. Okay. Uh, I'm going to split the patient for two weeks to control the edema and whatever inflammation is there and after that return the patient to the therapist who will start again trapping passive range of motion in that area. Uh, caution you to um, get an x-ray before you do the second stage because it's not infrequent that the attachment of your rod to the distal phalanx will disengage during the time and you 
talking two to three months from the first stage to the second stage. You want to be sure that your rod is where you put it, otherwise um, you're going to look kind of foolish going to the operating room and harvesting a tending graft and find that your sheath is no longer there. So it's a very small thing to do, but I must tell you it's very helpful. And your second stage simply consists of a small incision in the forearm to harvest the motor and a very small incision at the distal phalanx on the palmer side uh, to disengage your rod and pull it out. So if you look at that, again, we've identified the motor, and usually if it's a long finger, I'm going to go to the ring finger as the motor because I want a tendon that is not fibrotic and moving with good uh, line in there. Uh, when I remove the rod, I'm going to attach a small wire and pull it right through the sheath so that I can uh, go ahead and uh, just use that wire to insert my flexor graft as atraumatically as possible. When you harvest your tendon, and in this case it's a plantaris, I urge you to take off the paratenon because it's highly inflammatory uh, and it leaves you with a very nice collagen structure that can pass easily into your tunnel. Uh, and then I will do the proximal weave into the adjacent tendon, make that as secure as possible. And then I'm going to close that incision. My tendon is drawn up to the uh, distal portion of the finger and I'm going to uh, insert this below the stump of the profundus along the periosteum of the distal phalanx and I'm going to bring it out at the very tip of the finger and I'll tell you why in a second. If you look uh, here, here's a pulvertaff weave which I think is quite strong in that area. Uh, the middle junctures that you see are something I would do in the palm if I were doing a graft and the advantage of that is your plantaris or um, palmaris can be separated and drawn up over the tendon so you have a very smooth juncture uh, in the proximal portion so it will enter the sheath without problem. Now if you look at the distal portion, there are so many different ways to insert your tendon in that area. Um, but I um, enjoyed working with uh, William Littler and he had a different way of doing just about everything. So here, with the periosteal elevator, we're coming under the stump, bringing uh, the tendon right out through the tip of the finger, closing all of the incisions, a little bit of a clip on that area, and then set the tension with all your incisions closed. So you're not concerned uh, about disrupting anything, and once you've set the tension, the procedure is finished. Uh, I'll caution you a few things. Again, and when you're embarking on the procedure, you must make sure your hand, is, your finger is supple. I can't reiterate that more because if your finger is stiff, that's about the most you're going to get out of the finger with or without a tendon graft. Uh, there's an active prosthesis that is somewhere out there. I don't know if you can still find it, but it was an idea where you put a screw to the distal portion of the rod into the finger and you had a loop that looped approximately to a muscle uh, and you had an artificial tendon. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I think that elastic inflammation is a possibility and most often these fail by the screw disengaging. But for patients who had multiple tendons uh, that were injured where you just didn't have enough donors or motors, it was a solution uh, even though it didn't last for too long. But it was an interesting concept here. Your tension has to be perfect. You're weaving your, uh, your tendon graft into the motor and then, as I said, it's coming out to, to the very end. And the way that I will do it, it's brought out from the end, and the hand is laid flat on the table. And then you have a little metallic clip on there. You put the clip on, and you let the normal cascade come to uh, prominence here. And you'll see it's not enough. So you'll pull the tendon a little further, and then a little further, and you'll continue to repeat that until the cascade is exactly what you want. And then you'll do a little bit. So just a little bit more is good. Uh, and that will set the uh, area. I put a few hemoclips on there and I sew the tendon to the nail. And uh, a lot of people look at that and say, well, that, uh, that's pretty precarious. You may flex your finger and that thing will tear out. So I must tell you, in, in my career, I've only had two patients after tendon grafting who have fallen on their hand and ruptured the graft. And both times I assumed that they tore it out from the fingertip. They didn't. They actually tore the proximal juncture. Everything was sitting there, just put it right back into the tendon. Patients uh, went back to their usual activities. Um, some cautions, we said uh, don't use that. The stripper, if you're taking it out with a stripper, be careful, it's sharp and you may wind up with half the length you're looking for. 
that sets you back significantly. So use something blunt and don't be afraid to make incisions to get the perfect tendon. You have one shot at getting this correct. Your tension has to be perfect. Area. Uh, the question is whether you would put a tendon graft into a finger with an intact superficialis. Other than a child, I would not. I think you have the risk of losing more uh, than gaining in those fingers, so I use 16 as a cutoff, and uh, under 16 I'll do it, and over 16 I will not do it. Uh, and they must be therapy compliant, that's essential. Just a small word about a bridge graft, which is again a very infrequently used tendon graft. Uh, you have a gap in your palm, or especially at the thumb area, uh, and you don't want to put the entire tendon in. You think you can just fill that gap with a small tendon graft. Um, it doesn't work all that well because the tension of the muscle is offset a little bit, but for patients, rheumatoid arthritic patients who have tendon ruptures, it's really a short procedure. It does not take them through the full two stages, and it will give you a degree of motion that is certainly acceptable. So I think it's, uh, I think it's something that you should have in your armamentarium and use. Uh, the concern is whether the two junctures in the palm will run into the proximal sheath, and you have to be careful. And then, as Brian pointed out, you can vent the sheath uh, almost more than you thought you could, so you can really make this thing glide within there, but setting the tension is a little bit difficult. If you're pulling on a tendon uh, that has been transected and you're getting three to four centimeters of excursion, uh, that will usually tell you that there's still some degree of contraction left in that. If it's fibrotic and not moving at all, then you have to move on to something else. And there are, so if you can answer how a tendon graft develops its blood supply, um, please feel free to let me know, because I think that is the limiting step in tendon grafting. You know, when you put a tendon together, primarily you have an intrinsic blood supply that you think is going to supply the area. Um, I was impressed with what Tom was saying, where all the research is now moving back to reducing the adhesions and the scar and everything else, but you just have to be a student of you know, history, and you see back in the 40s, they thought the same thing, and they had some medications that would eliminate all adhesions, and what they had is an 80% rupture rate because it's the adhesions that bring the blood supply that allow the tendon junctures to remain intact. So for me, I, I, I go by the <clears throat> example that usually within the first three days, you don't have too much resistance to your tendon repair. And uh, into the second week, you have a significant amount. So usually, whether it's going to be a tendon repair or a tendon graft, I'm going to move them by day three or four in a controlled fashion. There may be a slight increase in degree of rupture, but if you offset your tensions uh, and your therapist pays attention and your patient is compliant, uh, that should get you through with a good range of motion. You're going to get adhesions because that's how the tendon is going to get its blood supply. So the outcome is somewhat predictable. You're looking at the extent of the injury, certainly the age of the patient. As you know, children usually will do better. Quality of the soft tissue is imperative and that's going to help you make the decision between a primary or a, a two-stage tendon graft. And again, your compliance with therapy is probably 50% uh, of what you're doing here. So if you look at the average results, uh, and that's a good result of a tendon injury repair, uh, I would say 80% is probably on the higher side, uh, may not be exactly what we see, and therapy is a partner in getting this patient back to where they will be. If the patient will not do therapy, I will not offer them a tendon graft. Uh, again, it's an art that requires strict attention to all your detail because any one of these steps is going to set the glide motion back. Um, and it's a wonderful operation for those who present in a delayed fashion, have very complex wound problems, or multiple structures uh, are involved. Thank you.